It was going to be on what we've covered so far. Sorry, what was it, Jonathan? Is the uh, quiz just going to be on what we've covered so far? Exactly. It's just going to be cover. Um, uh, I think today's material will be will be on it too. Uh, but there's a chance that today's material will not be on it. Uh, it's just a quiz. It's probably going to take 20 minutes, so I don't think I can put too much stuff on it. So let's just say um, the quiz only cover the first week, uh, the last Wednesday and the Thursday material. All right. Yeah. Good question. Um, so whatever we cover today, uh, quadratic functions, power functions, that will not be on the quiz. Good point. Um, so that's a quiz. And uh, homework. So we're going to have a a homework that's going to be available today, later today. Um, let me write it down as well. Well, let me share my screen first if I forgot. We are recording. Screen sharing. Okay, good. So homework two will be available sometime later today. Uh, I don't know if I, I can't even spell available today. Uh, and it will be due Sunday at 11, just like before. Um, so just definitely watch out for the for the email notification or some kind of notification from Canvas. All right. Um, any questions before we get started? Um, again, for the quiz, it's going to be, I'm, I'm just going to put the problem on Canvas. So when it's time to take the quiz, you're going to be able to access it and then just, you know, put your answers in your notebook. And then at the end, scan the pages in the notebook and upload those problems, those um, solutions. Um, should be fairly straightforward. Um, all right, so that's a quiz. Um, we are not going to have a review before the quiz, but if you have any questions before we take the quiz, I'm going to give you some time to ask your questions, but we're not going to have an official review session before the quiz. All right, um, if you don't have any questions, let's get started with today's class. Uh, let's see. If you have any questions, again, feel free to unmute yourself, put it in the chat box, um, whichever you feel comfortable. All right, so we're going to begin with quadratic functions. And I'm pretty sure that it's not your first time seeing quadratic functions. And you already know the graphs have U shape. It's either going to opening up or opening downwards. Um, depends on the leading coefficient a. Now I'm going to talk about different forms of quadratic functions. But before I do that, let's just give you a kind of a general example. For example, if this is my quadratic function, look, uh, doesn't have to go through there, it looks like this. And there's a few important points. For example, those two points on the x-axis is called x-intercepts. Sometimes a quadratic function may not have any x in the set. Sometimes it may have one, sometimes it has two. It depends on the location of the quadratic function. And this is the, will always be U-shaped, uh, correct. Quadratic functions always have U-shapes. The shapes of a U either gonna be upside down U or uh, a regular U. Um, but it's always gonna be one of those two shapes, good point. So this is gonna be a Y-intercept. And the quadratic functions always have a y-intercept. Depends on. Um, it doesn't matter where the sort of the the parabola or the u is. It's always going to have a y-intercept. But sometimes may not have. Uh, let me write it down. May. Uh, let me put it here. May have two, one, or zero x-intercepts. This is also an x-intercept in the example. And then it's going to have, this is called axis of symmetry. It's, a symmet it's always a symmetric shape. So in the middle, you can draw a dotted line. It's called axis of symmetry. It's always have an axis of symmetry. 
and it's always going to have this point on the bottom or the very top of the quadratic function of the graph. This is called the vertex. And the vertex is always on the axis of symmetry. So vertex is always um, axis of symmetry, or you can see axis of, axis of symmetry always go through the vertex. So that's sort of the graph of quadratic functions. Um, so let's talk about the, the function has different ways of writing it. Just like a linear function, we can write y equals uh, mx plus b, the slope intercept form, or you could have point slope form. It's the same equation, but just different way of writing it. So the first one, I'm gonna make a list here. So I'm gonna this three. I'm just gonna make a table, but I'm pretty confident that you have seen them before. So the first one is the standard form which has y equals a x squared plus b x plus c, where a, b, c are constant. x is just a changing variable, the input. And then next to it, I'm gonna put the vertex form, which is y equals, again, it's gonna be a, it's the same a as the one on the left, parentheses x minus h squared plus k. Now h and the k are constants, but note that we have a subtraction in the parentheses. It's x minus h, but outside we have addition. Well, it depends on what k is, right? If k is negative, then we have a subtraction. Um, if h is negative, we have x minus a negative number may become a positive, but it's the standard way to write it is x minus h squared plus k. And then we have this called intercept form, but I'm going to add x intercept form because the intercepts we talk about in this form is y equals a parentheses x minus s, x minus t. Sometimes we write x minus p, x minus q, but it doesn't matter. It's just going to be subtraction in those two parentheses. One is s, one is t. As you can see, if it's related to x directly, it's always a subtraction, right? X minus h in the vertex form, x minus s, x minus t in the x in the set form. All right, so those are the forms. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about a few important things about those different forms. For example, opening up or done, so the U shape, um, opening, up or done so it's all the same doesn't matter which form it is so if a is positive we get this opening up shape if a is negative we get this opening down shape and that's the same for all of them so i'm just going to use the arrow to show it's the same um, so just to emphasize that the a value in each form is the same a it doesn't matter how you write it the a never changes in those forms and the a is going to tell you whether the parabola is going to open up or it's going to open downwards and the next thing i have is to find x intercept so if we want to find the x intercept with the lines we know we set y equals zero right same thing here if we want to find x intercept in the standard form, we're going to set y equals zero. And then we're going to have solve zero equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And we might have to use a quadratic formula. We might have to factor, whichever works, as long as we can get the two x values. So that's how we find x intercept. In the vertex form, it's the same. So we're going to set. It's, when we find x intercept, it's always setting y equals zero. I'm gonna go through examples on this later, but let me just kind of go through all those different types. So we got zero equals a x minus h squared plus k, and we can solve it. Um, 
And the, in the x intercept form, the benefit of the x intercept is that we don't have to set y equals zero. We could just look at the formula itself, which is a x minus x, x minus t. So the two x intercepts are s comma zero, t comma zero. But you must make sure that it's in the correct form. It must have x minus s, x minus t to begin with if you want to extract the x-intercepts directly. If we have x plus s, then it's become a negative s. So that's the benefit of the x-intercept form is that you can tell what the x-intercepts are. Right? What about y-intercept? Well, to find a y-intercept, we're just gonna set x equals zero. And if we go back to the standard form, when we set x equals zero, and immediately we know the x squared term goes away, the bx term goes away, right? Because both the first and second term has x, we left with c. So the y intercept is zero comma c. So that's the good thing about standard form is you know what the y intercept is, it's just a c value. And the vertex form, you kind of have to do a little bit work it's not that straightforward. You can get an expression, but at this point, I don't care. I'm just going to say set x equals zero to find a y-intercept. And the same thing for the x-intercept form, we're going to set x equals zero. And then we're going to do the rest of the algebra. So that's y-intercept. All right. And the next thing I have is called axis of symmetry. Now, before I talk about axis of symmetry with those forms, I want to go back to the graph I had earlier. Um, so if you're with me for a minute. So remember that we had this green dotted line, that's the axis of symmetry, right? It's a vertical line and it goes through this X value, whatever this X value is. So if we want to say, okay, what is the equation for the axis of symmetry? Well, it's a vertical line goes through this specific X value. So it must be X equals some number, right? So that will be the equation for the vertical line as always, just like any vertical line. So axis of symmetry is have the, having the equation x equals some number. And if we have the standard form, the axis of symmetry is given by x equals negative b over 2a. And if we have the vertex form, the axis of symmetry is x equals h from the, the h in the parentheses. And if we have x intercept form, the axis of symmetry is x equals s plus t over two is the average of those uh, two x intercepts because it's symmetric. So it must be right in the middle of s of zero, t of zero, the two x intercepts. So that's the formula for axis of symmetry. And the next one I have is a vertex. With vert oh, before I talk about vertex, one thing I want to point out that if you remember quadratic formula, right? I mean, I'm sure most of you were required to memorize it. Quadratic formula says, uh, let's put on the side. So quadratic formula says, um, if we solve ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, then x equals negative b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. If you don't have this memorized, it's definitely worth the time and trouble to memorize it. So if you notice that negative b over 2a is right there. So if we drop the square root, you know, just drop that completely in the quadratic formula under the plus minus sign in front of it, what we end up with, negative b over 2a, that's the axis of symmetry. So if you already memorized the quadratic formula in the past, that's one way you can think about 
the axis of symmetry is just drop the square root plus minus. All right. Now vertex. Remember that earlier I said the vertex is always on the vertical line axis of symmetry, right? Which means the vertex has coordinates x comma y, the x coordinate of the vertex. So the x coordinate is the same as the axis of symmetry. So the negative b over 2a will be the x coordinate for the vertex in the standard form. And in the, the, in the vertex form, the vertex is going to be h comma k again. So that's the same, that's the same, but the k will be the y coordinate of the vertex. And the, in the x intercept form, the x coordinate is going to be s plus t over two, it's the same. And obviously, what about the y coordinate? We just have to find the x coordinate first, plug into the function, find the y that way. Any questions at this point? No? Okay, I hope you've seen this before. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna go through examples in a minute. I know there's a lot of things to take from here. I'm almost done, I have three items to list. Um, so the next thing I have is called minimum or maximum. So it depends on what the graph is. If we have a parabola or U-shaped opening, U-shaped, so we have a minimum. But if we have a upside down U-shape, then we're gonna have a maximum, right? Depends on what it is. So, but how do we figure out the minimum or maximum value of the graph? So if the graph looks like this, what is the maximum value from the graph, right? What is the highest Y value we could get? Well, that Y value, the minimum or maximum happens where vertex is. So located at vertex, but how do we get the value from there? Well, the minimum and the maximum value refer to the Y value. So that we can get by literally just looking at the y coordinate. So y coordinate of vertex. So whatever the y coordinate is, if we can find it, so that will be my either minimum or maximum. And whether it's a minimum or maximum, what depends on the a value, right? If a is up. A is positive, it opens up, we have a minimum. If A is uh, negative, it opens downwards, we have a maximum. So that's a minimum of maximum. And whatever this is, that's going to be a minimum of maximum, the Y coordinate. So as you can see, I just want to point out that a vertex is important because vertex connects axis of symmetry, maximum, minimum, as well as the point vertex, so it's the three concepts all together. And all right. So, and the two more things that will be really quick. The next thing is domain. So, domain of a quadratic function is always going to be all real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity. That's the same for all of them doesn't matter what form it is, it's the same. And the range, it depends on the shape. If, the, if A is positive, the parabola opens upwards, the range is gonna be from the, the lowest Y value, so Y minimum, so all the way to infinity. And in the vertex form, it's just going to be from k to infinity, because k is the, the minimum or maximum. But if the graph opens downwards with a negative a, then that's going to have a maximum, y maximum, sorry, uh, negative infinity to y maximum. 
And then this is going to be negative infinity to k. And this is again going to be y maximum with uh, negative infinity to y maximum. Um, I apologize for kind of piling up a lot of information with the different forms. Um, again, it's just quadratic functions, right? There's a lot of things we could talk about. We can talk about whether it's opening up or down x intercept. You don't have to memorize this. You could just say, okay, I'm just going to set y equals zero solve for x. That's fine. Um, same thing with y intercept. You don't have to memorize anything. You can just say, okay, I'm going to set x equals zero. I'm going to solve for y. Um, axis of symmetry is a little bit tricky um, because it depends on the form. There's different way of getting it. Uh, same thing with the vertex. But if you know the axis of symmetry, then you can find the vertex because you can find the x coordinate first and then find the y coordinate. And if you have a vertex, you have the minimum maximum. And domain and a range, that's just something to memorize. If you know the shape, then that shouldn't be a problem. All right, any questions on those topics? All right, if not, let's look at one example. Where's my example? Ah, here. Yeah. All right, so let me cut this. So this is the example I took from the book. So example, you don't have to draw the graph precisely. So here's the example. And I want to find a function for the graph. Well, it's a quadratic function, right? Because it has this like a U-shaped parabola. Okay, so which one do we use? We can either use a standard form or we can use a vertex form or x-intercept form, right? It's up to us to decide. And generally speaking, the easiest one is probably the vertex form or the x-intercept form, one of the two. So I'm gonna go with the vertex form. And then usually you don't want to go with the x-intercept form because in that form, all you know is a C, you have to find the other A and the B, which is not easy, take a little bit longer. Um, so we're gonna use the vertex form, has the general form Y equals A, X minus H squared plus K. So if I know my vertex, remember vertex in the vertex form is H comma K. Well, I can look at the graph, so it looks like this is my vertex, negative two comma negative three. So that's like an H comma K value values. So I can take those two numbers directly substitute it into the equation. So if I put in there, so I got Y equals A, I don't know what it, what it is, but I can um, plug in H. So that's an X minus negative two squared plus K, which is negative three. And I can simplify one more step. So that's an A, parentheses x minus the negative two, which is x plus two, right, squared, and then minus three outside. With the vertex form, we already figure out two, two constants in the formula. And then we just need to figure out what a is. So to find a, we need another point other than the vertex. Well, which point can we use? It looks like we can use the y-intercept or we can use the x-intercept. It's up to you, but I'm gonna use the y-intercept, which is x equals zero, y equals negative one. All right? And then we can just put the x, y directly into the equation we had above. So we get negative one equals a parentheses zero plus two squared minus three. And we can solve for a quickly by adding three on both sides. So we got two equals a times zero plus two squared is two squared, which is four. So we get a equals half by dividing by four on both sides. So now we have it y equals one half x plus two squared minus three.
just quickly remind you, since we have H is negative two, that's why we have a plus sign, but it's actually X minus a negative two. All right, any questions? Okay. All right. Um, if you don't have any questions, let's see, we can do, um, well, we can take this example. So we can convert different form between the forms. So we can convert uh, the vertex form to standard form. So if we have y equals one half x plus two squared minus three, how do I convert this to the standard form? Well, we just have to figure out the x squared term, the x term and the constant term, right? So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take the square the x plus two square part, and then we're gonna fully boil that. So we got y equals one half, so leave the one half, leave the negative three. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply out x plus two square, which is x plus two, x plus two. And you can, you can memorize the formula to do that, or you can FOIL whichever you feel comfortable. So that's gonna be one half, x squared plus 2x plus another 2x, oops, and then plus 4. Don't forget we have a negative 3 outside. So if we are careful here, we get 1 half x squared plus 4x plus 4. And if we distribute the negative 2, uh, sorry, 1 half in there, so we get one half x squared plus two x plus two, but then we have minus three. So in the end, we're gonna end up with one half x squared plus two x minus one. So this is the standard form because we have a value, which is half positive two is a b value and a negative one is a c value. All right, any questions about this? All right, let me give us um, another example to look at. Let's see what's the next example. Any questions? I know that I might go through a little bit too fast at this point. But if that's the case, definitely let me know. Um, all right, so when you finish writing, I'm gonna give you another example. So let's see, we have y equals negative four x squared. Hope the numbers work out well. Um, plus 4x minus 3. I'm going to change this to 8. Apology for that. Um, 8. And then let's just see minus plus five. Okay, so let's leave it there. So this is the given this example. What we're going to do is we're going to find the following. Well, we're just going to go down the list. Right. So first of all, we want to know whether the graph opening up or down. So sketch a graph. Uh, not sketch a graph, just find um, opening up or done.
And then the next thing is we're going to find is we're going to find x intercepts and y intercept. I hope it's not too difficult to find x intercept. Um, if it is, we just use the quadratic formula. All right. So first of all, I want to know if it's opening up or opening down. Well, let's just look at the A value. That's all I care about, right? The A value. So A equals negative four, which is less than zero. If A is negative, then the graph is going to opening downwards. That's it. So we don't have to do any algebra, just look at the A value. And then we need to find the x-intercept. So remember, if find the x-intercept, we're going to set y equals zero. So if we set y equals zero, we get zero equals negative four x squared plus eight x plus five. And I don't think it's nice enough to factor. Um, uh, maybe, 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 um, maybe negative four plus eight. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna quickly see if I can find fact, uh, facts of this. Uh, yeah, I'm not confident. Um, so I'm gonna give up on factoring. It might be, we might be able to factor this, but, uh, um, but I, my brain can't work right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use, um, Quadratic formula. Um, so quadratic formula says if I want to find x, so x equals negative b, b is eight, so negative eight plus minus square root of b squared, eight squared minus four times negative four, four a c, which is five, and divide by two a. And it turns out that I'm just quickly looking at this. We might not be able to have any x intercepts because that's going to be negative eight plus minus. Uh, oh, it works. Okay. So 64 plus 4, 4, 16, 20, 80. So we got 144. So it does factor nicely. Interest negative eight. So we get negative eight plus minus square root of 144, which is 12. So plus minus 12 divided by negative eight. So it turns out that the two x intercepts we can write from here is, so we're gonna write two values, negative eight plus 12 over negative eight and negative eight minus 12 over negative eight. A lot of negatives, just be careful. And it turns out that the 2x value is going to be negative 8 plus 12. Uh, that's a full 4 divided by negative 8. That's negative 1 half. And the second value is going to be negative 8 minus 12. That's negative 20. Negative 20 over negative 8. So that's going to be a positive uh, 5 over 2. Okay, so that's work out well. We're lucky. So those are the two x values. So that means the x intercepts are negative one half, zero, five over two, zero. All right, any questions about finding the x intercepts here? All right, to find the y intercept, hopefully it doesn't take that long. So find y intercept. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna take the c value because the given function we have c which is five. So y intercept is gonna be zero comma five. We don't have to plug in zero, we could, but we don't have to. And the next thing we're gonna find is axis of symmetry, because eventually we're going to find vertex axis of symmetry, which is going to be x equals negative b over 2a. And we know the b value, which is 8. So that's negative 8 over 2 times negative 
two uh, a, which is negative four. So we got negative eight over negative eight equals one. So we have axis of symmetry, which is x equals one. It's a vertical line. It's not a one x value. It's actually every point on that dotted line. And then we're going to find the vertex. Well, vertex has x, y coordinates since we already have the axis of symmetry. That means we already have this axis of symmetry. The, va the x value becomes the x coordinate. So we already have one number in the vertex. We just have to find the other one. So to find the y coordinate, we're going to take the x value, the x coordinate, we're going to put back into the equation. Rem remember here, x equals 1, right? So we're going to take 1, we're going to put it into this original quadratic function, negative 4x squared plus 8x plus 5. So we're going to put 1 there. So that's going to be y equals negative 4, 1 squared plus 8 times 1. And then my uh, plus 5, I believe. Let me double check, plus 5. So that's what how we, that's how we're going to end up with the y coordinate by plugging the x x coordinate. So we get negative four plus eight. That's a positive four plus five, which is going to be nine. So this is my y coordinate of the vertex, which is nine. So there we have the vertex. And the next thing we could do is to find the uh, minimum maximum, right? So here we know what the graph looked like. Earlier we said because A is negative, so we're opening downwards. So since A equals negative four is negative, the graph opening downwards. Well, if it's opening downwards, then it must have a maximum somewhere. So the function has a maximum value and the actual value, the maximum value is, so what is this maximum y value for all points on the quadratic curve? That is gonna give by this nine from the vertex. So that value is just nine because we already found it. So that's, if we, like I said, if we know the vertex, we can just directly take the value out of the maximum or minimum value out of the vertex. We don't have to do anything. If we have the axis of symmetry, that means we know the x coordinate of the vertex. Any questions about what I did? All right. So one more thing on this example, I know it's a long example. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do, so take this given problem, y equals negative four x squared plus eight x plus five. And we're gonna convert this to the vertex form. Well, how do we convert it to the vertex form? In the past, you probably learned about completing the square. That's one way. And if here, we're not going to do it. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to find axis of symmetry, which we already did using y, uh, using x equals negative b over 2a, which we found out that x equals 1. So that's what we found finding axis of symmetry. And then the second step we're going to do is we're going to find the vertex. Uh, we're not going to do the work because we already did, right? So remember earlier, after we find the axis of symmetry, we take the one put into the function, we get y equals nine. So the vertex we had is one nine. And this will give me the h 
and the k values and the three take a value and vertex which is h comma k we're going to put into the vertex form and what is the a value well a is the same a is negative four right that doesn't change so this is the a value a negative four it doesn't change this is my vertex so if i have a if i have vertex then i know what the vertex form is which is y equals a is negative four it doesn't change x minus h h is one x minus one squared plus k k is nine so personally i think this process might be a little bit longer than completing the square but it's less confusing uh, so find the axis of symmetry, which we can use to find the vertex. If we have the vertex, we just take the A value and the vertex together, put into this form. And all we did is we replace the A with the H and the K. All right, let me stop there. I know that's a lot of, inf a lot of takeaway with quadratic functions. Um, any questions about what I did so far at this point. All right. Um, in that case, oops, let me go back up to find my example. I have another example here. Let's see. Um, again, this example is taken from the book, so I'm not going to um, uh, write down the problem step by step. Oh. All right, let's see. Uh, why don't I? And do this. I might just cut the whole thing. Uh, okay, there we go. All right, let me put those examples at the end. Oh yeah, my goodness, this is like a Zoom thing. It's always in my way. All right, anyway, let me um, make this front bigger. All right, so here's the first example we're gonna look at. So it says, hold on, we cannot see it yet because I need to create more space. Um, it says, so we want to find the maximum value of some quadratic function. It says in the backyard, uh, um, a farmer wants to enclose a rectangular space for a new garden within her fenced backyard. So she has a backyard. Uh, let me just draw a diagram here to help us. So this is the backyard. And somewhere in there, she wants to use a fence to enclose a rectangular space. And then she purchased 80 feet of wire fencing to enclose three sides of the rectangular space. And she will use one section of the backyard fence as a full size. So this is the backyard already has fence. So what she's gonna do, she's gonna use fencing material. So the new one and create a rectangular shape and the fence that she uses only covers three sides. And the full side is already there, so we don't need to cover anything. All right, so that's what this problem says. So the, the fencing material that she used covers the left side, the front side, and the right side, but the back side is already there. We don't put any fence there. All right. So that's what it means. 
So A says write a formula for the area enclosed by the fence if the sides of fencing perpendicular to the existing fence and have a length L. So perpendicular to the existing fence are those this side, which is L, this side is also L because the rectangles or opposite sides are congruent. And we don't know what this side parallel to the fence there is. Okay, so we need the area. So what is the area for this? Well, we know for rectangles, area is equal to length times width, right? And depends on which side we call it length, which side we call it width. So now let's just use the same variable. So if this side on the left and the right have a length L, then the other side, we're gonna call it the width, definitely. So we want to know the area, which is length times width. But the problem here is that we have area, we don't know. We have length, we don't know. We have width, we don't know. We got three variables, one equation. That's never, good, never a good sign, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the information we know. We know that the fence that she used is 80 feet. So total fencing material, total fence. fencing wire is equal to 80 feet. And we're gonna use that information to simplify the area formula. And note that the fencing wire, the wire only covers three sides. So the three sides are L and W and another L. So those three sides are covered by the wire and that's gonna to equal to 80 feet. And from here, what we can do is we can solve for W in terms of L. So if we subtract two L's from left side, then we get W equals 80 minus two L. And this is a good thing because we could take this expression and we can substitute for W in the area formula. Then we get area equals L times 80 minus 2L. And which we, which is a good thing. Now we have one equation with only two variables instead of three, so we get rid of one of them. So that's gonna be 80L minus 2L squared. Another way to write it is bring the negative 2L squared in front and the 80L at the end. So this is the area in terms of L. So area of the rectangular space. And then the next part says, what, what dimensions should she make the garden to maximize the enclosed area? Well, that says, so basically here we have this area formula, we want maximum area. So we want maximum value of the area, well, which is the same thing as finding the maximum value of the area function, right? And the area function we have it, which is negative two L squared plus 80 L. So the maximum value of this is gonna be, all right, to find the maximum, we have to do a few things. The first thing is we're gonna find the axis of symmetry. So first thing, so step one, find axis of symmetry. Because we want to know the maximum, the maximum value is inside the vertex, right? So we have to find axis of symmetry first. So X in this case is L equals negative B over two A, which is negative of 80 over two times a, two times negative two. So this is my a value, this is my b value. There's no c in this formula. So if I simplify this, we get negative 80, 
negative 80 over negative 4, so we get positive 20. So that's what L is. That's the axis of symmetry. And if I want to know the, the want to have the maximum value, so I can take 20, put in there, but so to find max value, I can take 20, put into the area formula. So I get area equals negative 2, 20 squared plus 80 times 20. So that should give me a maximum value. But that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the dimensions, right? So we know that when L equals 20, that will give us a maximum area. So L corresponding to the maximum value, maximum area, right? Okay, so L equals 20, that's one of the sides. What about the other side of the rectangle that will give me the maximum? So since L, um, L equals 20 gives maximum area, and L by length by width gives dimensions of rectangle. So we just need to find out the width. Well, if L equals 20, what's the width? So width equals, we had a formula for width earlier, 80 minus 2L, that's the formula relating length and width, right? So we can find the width from 80 minus 2L, so W equals 80 minus 2 times length, 20, which is 40. So 20 is the length, 40 is the width, so 20 by 40 feet in each direction. So 20 in the length direction and the 40 in the width direction, um, that will be the dimension. Any questions about this problem? I know it's, you might have seen it before in your Algebra 2 class. Um, typically, that's what we talk about when we, when we talk about quadratic functions um, as an application. But you probably have not seen it. Um, in that case, that's fine. It's normal. All right, let me know if you have any questions. But the setup is obviously we know the area for rectangle, right? Length times the width. But in this case, we have to write the area in terms of one variable, not two, because if you have two variables, then we're going to have a problem. If area depends on length and width, then we don't know where to begin with. But if the area depends only on one of the variables, then we'll be good. And then the next step is to recognize that if we want to know the dimension that will give us the maximum area, then we need to find the maximum value from the function, area function. We need to find the axis of symmetry, and that's going to give us the x coordinate of the vertex. If we're looking for the maximum value, we can take that put into the function. If we don't look for the maximum value, we can just use the, the length to find out the width. All right, any questions? So let me go through one more example before we, um, uh, I'm just looking ahead. Uh, let me go through one more example before we take a quick five minute break. So the next example I have um, is this one. Let me give me a second, I'll show you. So the next example is, about a ball throwing upwards. So a ball is thrown upward from the top of a 40 feet high building at a speed of 80 feet per second. So somewhere at the top of this building and a ball is being thrown upwards at a speed of 80 feet per second. And the let's see going up is a positive direction and going down is a negative direction. The ball's height above the ground, so if we measure from the ground, 
So this is the height. At any point, right, the ball goes up and then comes back, but it's probably, it's not gonna land on the building, it's gonna land on the ground. And the height has the function h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 80 t plus 40. So that's given. And the a says, when does the ball reach the maximum height? So at what time does it reach the maximum height? Well, that's something we have to think about, right? Where does the maximum happen? The maximum happens at the vertex, right? Which means we literally have to relate maximum with vertex all the time. So think about vertex. Well, if we think about vertex, then we have to know the x coordinate of the vertex is the axis of symmetry. So if we want to know when the ball reaches the maximum, which we're looking at the x coordinate of the axis of symmetry, I mean, the vertex, which is the axis of symmetry. So that's what we need to find. So find axis of symmetry. Which is T in this case equals negative B over 2A. So that will be negative 80 over 2 times negative 16. So that's if we do it correctly. So let's see, divide by 16. Um, I think we get 5 over 2. Double check. I'm just going to do it quickly. So at t equals 5 over 2 seconds, I believe, um, that's when we have the, ver the vertex. So from, let's just redraw the diagram. So it starts at this top of the 40 feet tall building, and then the ball is going to go up, and then they land on the ground. So this is a 40 feet. And this vertex happens with axis of symmetry at t equals 5 over 2. So this is the time. This is the height. The vertex is right here. So that's the how long it takes. So the axis of symmetry in this example tell us how long does it take to reach maximum because we're looking for the x value. And the b says, what is the maximum height of the ball? So what is this maximum value corresponding to this in, uh, from this point vertex? Well, that's the case we have to take t value put into the equation. So b, we need to plug in t equals 5 half into the equation. The function h of t, h of 5 half, is equal to negative 16 times 5 over 2 squared plus 80 times 5 over 2 plus 40. And if we do the algebra correctly, we should be able to get the height, which is going to be um, negative 20 plus 200 plus 40. So we get 220. Double check my math, it might be wrong. So that's the maximum, that's the height corresponding to the axis of symmetry, the y coordinate of the vertex. And this is my maximum value because we know it's maximum, the graph opening downwards, right? So we have a maximum. So that's the maximum height. And the C says, when does the ball hit the ground? So it's another question. It says, when does the ball hit the ground? Well, if the ball touched the ground, what is the height? So when the ball is touching the ground, so at this point, the height equals zero, right? Which means the y value equals zero. We're looking for the x intercept, basically. In this case, the t intercept. So find t intercept 
of the x-intercept if we're familiar with the terms. So that's how we're going to figure out when does the ball hit the ground is when we find the x-intercept or t-intercept in this case. Well, how do we find the x-intercept in general? We set y equals zero, right? In this case, when we find t-intercept, we're going to set h equals zero. So set h of t equals zero. So we get zero equals negative 16 t squared plus 80 t plus 40. Um, I think we might be able to factor this, but I'm not even going to try that hard to do it. So I'm just going to say use the quadratic formula. So t equals negative b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4a all over 2a. And I don't have the answer I should have. Uh, we should get two values. One is positive, one is negative. Uh, we take the positive value because the, ne the negative value is corresponding to a negative time. We don't consider negative time in this case. So we take positive value at the end. Now, for the sake of time, is it okay if I don't show you the process to solve for t from here? Okay, awesome, thank you. I see a couple of thumbs up and the nodding heads. All right, of uh, 7.13, so let's take about seven minutes break, come back at 7.20. Sounds good? All right, I'll see you at 7.20.
All right, welcome back. Um, let's see. All right, let's double check, make sure the recording is still going on. Looks like we're good. All right, so welcome back. So we're gonna spend the next half of this lecture going over. We're gonna skip the example on maximum value, uh, maximum revenue. So what we're gonna go over next is Um, it's going to be power functions and the polynomial functions. So power functions, this is uh, section 3.3, power functions. All right, so power functions has a general form, y equals ax to the p, where p is a real number, So P could be a fraction, could be negative, could be any number. So that's what power function. And the A obviously is a coefficient. So a example of power functions could be, um, let's say Y equals, uh, for example, just X. That's a typical example with P equals one, A equals one, right? Um, just Y equals X. It could also be, uh, y equals, let's see, uh, negative x to the one half, which is square negative square root of x, that's fine. Or we could have y equals, uh, for example, uh, x to the five, uh, six x to the negative two, which is the same thing as six over x squared. So those are the power functions examples. Now, what are, which functions are not power functions? So counter examples, for example, linear functions, they're not power functions. Y equals MX plus B, they're not power functions because we have this plus B part that's not allowed. Um, exponential functions, you've probably seen it before, Y equals uh, two to the X, that's not okay. Uh, maybe sine, cosine, trig functions, right? So there are a lot of examples that are not power functions. Quadratic functions are not power functions, unless we just keep the x squared term. Um, if we have more than one term, then it's not power functions. All right, but we don't just look at general power functions. We look at specific examples, so specific. Group of power functions. The reason we look at them because they are related to uh, polynomial functions. The so specific groups of power functions are y equals a x to the n, where n instead the exponent instead of being any real number, so n here is non negative integer. So that's what's specific about this group because all the, expo the, the exponent of the power functions are considered to be positive or zero, but it has to be an integer. So zero or positive integer. So it must be non-negative integers. And uh, with this functions, that's a very unique thing about the end behaviors. So end behaviors of y equals ax to the n. So it depends on what n is. So let me, so if a is positive, and n is even, so n is an even number, and the a is positive, then the graph, y equals ax to the n, looks like this. Kind of like y equals x squared, the quadratic function, it's a u shape. And the a is negative, n is even, and we're gonna have this upside down u shape. But it's not, this, uh, it's just have the general shape, 
but it's not exactly like a quadratic function uh, because for example, the U might be looking like this more, more square at the corners. So that could be a graph for the Y equals uh, X to the 100th power, something like that. So the corners are a lot more like a 90 degree angles than the regular parabola. And uh, if N equals odd, more than one, um, then we're gonna generally see the shape like a uh, Y equals X cubed, the chair shape. But if it's a street, if it's N equals one, then we just have a straight line, right? We still have the N behavior the same, sort of like going like this way. Um, and if A is negative, we're gonna see this sort of like a backwards chair. Well, I don't know which one is backwards, depending on the facing. Uh, if n equals one, we're going to see this um, decreasing line. But the n behavior are describing by this part. So if n is even, a is positive, we get both ends going upwards. If a is negative and it's even, we get both ends going downwards. I'm using a red color here. And if n is odd, a is positive, we get right side going up left side going down, whether it's a line or a chair is the same. And if A is negative and is odd, we get this left side going up, right side going down. So that's something that we should pay attention to the end behavior. The middle doesn't really matter that much. So that's the a, that's a end behavior of this type of power functions. And here's an example. Describe the n behavior behaviors of y. Uh, let's just use f of x of um, f of x equals negative x to the negative nine. Oh, sorry, I don't know why I put negative nine. X to the ninth power. Well, in this function. By looking at it, we know that the a is negative one, just a negative tell us it's a equals negative one, it's less than zero, and that the n, exponent n is nine, which is odd. And that's gonna tell us that, so since a is less than zero, n is odd, we get this chair shape, but it's not the regular chair, it's the backwards chair. So the end behavior looks like this. So to describe it, you can say, okay, as X goes to negative infinity, the Y goes to positive infinity. As X goes to positive infinity, Y goes to negative infinity. So what I meant by that is if we go to the left, X goes to negative infinity and the Y is gonna go up as X goes towards the left. And as X go towards the right, the Y is gonna decrease. The Y goes to negative infinity. But generally, like to be honest, like for me, I usually just draw arrows. I don't even write down the, the statements. So either way of describing the end behavior is fine. Any questions on this? And the next thing we're gonna look at are polynomial functions. So polynomial functions had the standard form, f of x equals a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus one x to the n minus one plus a sub n minus two x to the n minus two. And this is maybe a lot of terms, maybe just no other terms, but the general formula has a lot of terms. And that's gonna be a square x square plus a one x to the first power plus a zero. And in this, 
general form, we arrange the terms by following the exponent in a descending order. So the exponent decreases each time. So the last term is x to zero. So the term with a higher exponent, we put it on the, on the left. The terms with lower exponent, we put it on the right. And the an, an minus one, an minus two, all those a's, we subscript, those are the coefficients. And the n, n minus one, n minus two, those are the exponents. Now, here's one thing that we have to pay attention to, which is the first term. So, the term with highest exponent of x is the leading term. And I just I usually just use LT stands for leading term. And this term is very important because it's going to tell us the n behavior of this polynomial function. Uh, I'll write down that later. And the coefficients of the leading term is leading the leading coefficient. Sometimes I write how e leading, sorry, LC leading coefficient. And at the degree of the polynomial, polynomial function is the highest exponent of X from all terms. So if we take the n, the n minus one, n minus two, if we look at all those values, the highest value in this case, n, so that will be the degree of the polynomial. And the degree is gonna tell us the shape and the, the leading coefficient is gonna tell us whether it's gonna, both sides gonna go up, going down, um, all those along with the leading term. Now, I want to point out one thing that I forget to mention. For polynomial functions, all exponents, are, so all the n's, n minus one, n minus two, are non-negative integers. Which means the polynomial function here, basically the sum of a lot of power functions that we talked about earlier, the specific type of power function, the one that was exponents that are non-negative integers. So if we take a lot of terms from those power functions, we add them, we get a polynomial function. All right, so that's polynomial functions. And let me give you an example. That's not a polynomial function. Uh, but before I do that, let me see if I forget something. Okay. Um, all right, a counter example. For example, if I have f of x equals, let's say three x squared minus two x plus five, that's all looking good. So, but if I say minus uh, square root of x, for example, and this is not gonna be okay because if we look at the exponents of all the terms, this is the x equals two. I mean, the exponent equals two, so that's fine, non-negative integer. This one has an exponent one, which again is non-negative integer. And the five has the exponent zero, which is okay. Zero is fine. But then the square root of x, that's gonna give us problem because that's gonna give us exponent, which is half, and which is not an integer. So that's gonna be the issue. So it's not 
a polynomial function. All right. Um, so the next thing I wanted to quickly mention about polynomial functions. So all polynomial functions. I'm just going to write f and s. All polynomial functions are continuous, which means if you, it's just a nice smooth curve. There's no jumps, there's no missing parts. It's continuous everywhere. And the domain of all polynomial functions, it's going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. There's no x value we cannot put into the polynomial function. So it covers all real numbers. Now the range will depend on the actual shape of the polynomial function. It could have a minimum, it could have a maximum, depend. So the range, I'm not gonna write it down. All right, let's see. Uh, maybe we should look at an example. But the, hold on, I know I'm writing a lot of notes. So let me just see. Terms with highest exponent is the leading term, coefficients, of uh, the leading term is the leading coefficient. Degree of the polynomial function is the highest exponent. The count example is here. And all polynomial function are continuous. The domain is from negative infinity to infinity. And the next thing I want to add is the end behaviors. So the tails are polynomial functions, basically. Behaviors of polynomial functions and S equals and behave behaviors of leading terms. So if we look at the leading term, try to figure out what the ends look like. The end behavior, the two ends will be exactly the same behavior as the ends of the polynomial function. For example, if the leading term has ends look like this, like both sides going up, then the polynomial function will also have both sides, the both ends going up. So they have the same behavior. So if we ever want to know you know, as x goes to infinity, what does the polynomial function approach to? We just look at the leading term. We don't have to worry about the rest. The, the y-intercept, the x-intercept, none of those matters if we look at the end behavior. All right, I think that's what I had to write. But the, let's look at some examples. So let's see, here's the example. Find the end behavior, behaviors of the following functions. The first one I have is f of x equals seven x squared minus six x cubed plus three x, for example. Well, Okay, so here we have a polynomial function, right, with three terms, and all the exponents are pos um, positive two, three, one. Okay, so how do I know what the end looks like? Now, be careful, the leading term, that's what we're looking for, right? That will give us the end behavior of the polynomial function. It's not the first term, so note, leading term is not the same thing as first term. Depends on how we write it. If we write it randomly, it's not the first term. If we write it by organizing the terms with respect to the exponent, then that will be correct. So be careful. So let's rewrite this. F of X equals the term with the highest degree goes first. So that's the highest exponent goes first. So that's the highest exponent three. So that, let's put negative six X cubed first. And then the one with the next exponent, two, goes next. So seven x squared goes next, and then three x goes the end, stays at the end. So that's the first thing we want to pay attention to when we're looking for the leading term. 
So here we have negative six X cubed. So this is my leading term. Not seven X squared because seven X squared was not leading. It's just first term. If we write it correctly, it's not even the first term. So this leading term, if we look at it, the leading coefficient a equals negative six, which is negative. And the, the exponent, which is three, which is odd. So if we have a negative leading coefficient and a odd exponent, and the end behavior is gonna be a backwards chair. So that's what the ends look like for that leading term. And therefore, and behaviors of the polynomial function, f of x equals negative six x cubed plus seven x squared plus three x, it's gonna have exactly the same end behavior as the leading term. So it's gonna look like this on the left and decreasing on the right. So what this one says, like we saw it before, so as X goes to negative infinity, the Y goes to positive infinity. As X goes to positive infinity, the Y will go to negative infinity. Any questions at this point? So if we want to know the end behavior, all we do is find the leading term. And the, from the leading term, we get the, the degree, which is three, the leading coefficient, and that's enough to tell us what the, the end behaviors are. And let's practice a little bit more. So find the degree of above polynomial function. Well, the degree is the highest exponent. Well, the, where's the high, highest exponent? It's always in the leading term, right? We already know the exponent of the leading term is three. Therefore, the degree is gonna be three. So the degree is always the highest exponent, the exponent of the leading term. All right, let's take a look at another example. Before I do that, before I go over another example, any questions about finding the leading term, finding the, the degree or the end behaviors of a polynomial function? All right, so the second example I have is f of x equals 4x squared, parentheses, x plus one, x minus two cubed. So this polynomial function is in the factored form. And obviously, you know, we could, if we want to find the leading term, we could just spoil everything completely at the end, we will be able to know which one is the leading term, the term with the highest exponent. Well, that's gonna be a lot of trouble, isn't it? Because we might make a mistake in the process because this is the x cubed, x minus two cubed. We have to expand that. Then we have to multiply with the x plus one. Then we have to multiply by four x squared. That's a lot of work. So here's a shortcut. So to find leading term, we're just gonna multiply all the terms with x, with exponent, and coefficient. So multiply, I'll explain what I meant. Multiply all parts, all x parts, with coefficient and exponent. 
So what I mean by this is, so we just look at all the x parts. We multiply them together, but we have to carry the coefficients and exponents. For example, the first part x we see is this x. We see the coefficient is four and the, the exponent is two. So we're gonna take four x squared. So we carry the exponent and the coefficient. Then we're gonna multiply with the second x we see, which in the parentheses, we see this x. There's no coefficient, well, coefficient is one and the exponent is one for that parentheses. So we just multiply by x. And then we move on to the next x we see, which is in the last parentheses. Well, what is the coefficient of this x is one again, right? But this x minus two has the exponent three. So we have to carry the exponent three. So if we multiply all those x parts with the exponent and the coefficients, and if we are careful, we should end up with four x to the square, x to the first, that's three plus times x cubed, that's x to the six. So this is my leading term. All right, so if you have never done this before, it might be a bit tricky, but that always works. So we take all the x parts that we see, we, if, the, if it has any coefficients, great, we keep it. If it has any exponents, we keep it. Now we're gonna multiply them together. That will give us a leading term. We don't need to expand anything. We just need the leading term. All right, if we know the leading term, can we figure out the degree of polynomial? Well, we could, right? Because the degree of the polynomial is the highest exponent. The highest exponent is in the leading term, which is six. So degree is six. And we have a leading term. Can we find the end behavior? End behaviors of polynomial function. Well, that's going to be the same as end behaviors of the leading term. And the leading term, I already know it has the coefficient four, which is positive and the exponent is even. So if I have a positive coefficient four and a um, even exponent six, and then if you remember earlier, we talked about the end behavior. If we have positive coefficient, even exponent, it's gonna look like this going up. So the end behavior of the polynomial function is gonna look exactly the same. So this one says as x goes to negative infinity, the y is gonna go up, y goes to infinity. As x goes to positive infinity, the y also going up, going to infinity. Or we can just draw the arrows to describe. So that's the end behavior of the polynomial function. Any questions? Awesome. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is how do we find x intercepts and the y intercepts of polynomial functions? Okay. Uh, it's exactly the same process as we did with quadratic functions or linear functions. So find x intercepts. What we do, we're looking for x value, right? So what that means, that means we're gonna set y equals zero. And sometimes it may not be easy to solve by hand, we might have to use a computer or calculator to solve for the x from there. But uh, let's just take an easy example. Let's see, um, for example, f of x equals four x squared times x plus one times x minus two cubed. So what we do is to find x in step, we set y equals zero. So zero equals four x squared x plus two Oh, no, x plus one, sorry, x minus two cubed. So if I set this equal zero, well, how do we find x? 
it looks like we got a lot of terms multiplied together. That's a good thing. That means each of this term in the product could possibly be zero or could be zero altogether. So that means four x squared could equal to zero. Divide by four, we get x equals zero. Um, so x squared equals zero. And then if we take square root, x equals plus minus zero, which is again zero. We could also have from the middle term, x plus one could be zero. And if subtract one, we get x equals negative one. We could also have x minus two cubed equals zero. If we take cube root, x minus two equals cube root of zero, which is zero, adding two, so we get x equals two. So there we have it. We get x equals zero, x equals negative one, and x equals two. Those are the x-intercepts. And it's the same thing if the question says, oh, finding the zeros, finding the roots, it's the same. We try to find x intercepts. Uh, find zeros or find roots or find x intercepts. They all refer to the same process, looking for the same x values. Right? So since we talk about finding x-intercepts, finding the zeros, now I want to talk about one thing here. So multiplicity of zeros of a polynomial function which says if x minus uh p uh, i don't think we use p here let me just double check make sure i use the same notation ah if x minus h to the p is a factor of a polynomial function means that the polynomial function in the factored form has x minus h to the p power, then x equals h is a zero or a root or a x-intercept. Suppose h is real. In this case, we talk about real of the polynomial function. And with multiplicity of P. So what that means is that it just means the multiplicity, it just means that this is root or this is zero or this X intercept repeats itself multiple times. For example, in the, in the, the example we had when we were solving for, um, Let's take the simple example on the right here. When we were solving x minus two cubed equals zero, right? And we end up with x equals two, that's the x intercept. But because in the process, when we take cube root, so we had x minus two cubed. So the x equals two actually repeats itself three times. So you could have x equals two, it works. You have another x equals two, it works as well. You have a third x equals two, it also satisfies the equation. But because they're all equals two, so that we write them as one root, but this root repeats three times. So x equals two as a zero or as a root has multiplicity of three. So which is corresponding to the exponent of this factor form. Now, the middle one, let's go backwards. So x plus one equals zero. When we solve for this, we just get negative one, right? And uh, if we think about the power or the exponent of x plus one, which is just one. So this one, x equals negative one, we see has multiplicity of one. It doesn't have a multiplicity of two or three, just have a multiplicity of one. 
And what about the x equals zero? If we look at it, because we had x squared equals zero at some point, it has the exponent two. So at the end, we get x equals zero. So x equals zero as the root has multiplicity of two. because of the square x squared equals zero. So really, when we look at each of these factors in the polynomial function, we pay attention to the exponent. If the exponent is one, we get multiplicity of one when we solve for the uh, root or the zero or the x-intercept. But if we has the exponent three, then the zero or the x-intercept is gonna have a multiplicity of three. All right, any questions about multiplicity of the zeros? Now, why do we talk about this? The multiplicity of the x-intercepts of the zeros is going to tell us how the graph is going to cross the x-axis. So this is a local behavior, one of them. So multiplicity of zeros tells how the graph of a polynomial function crosses, let me put in the next line, crosses x-axis at this x-intercepts. So I'm going to draw a few examples. So if it has a multiplicity of one, so multiplicity of one, so the graph is going to cross the x-axis like a straight line. So right here, Near, right at the x-intercept, the graph is going to cross it like a straight line. And if we have a multiplicity of two, two or four or six, all the even powers, and at this x-intercept, the graph is going to cross this x-intercept, looks like a parabola so it's going to look either like this and when i say cross it doesn't mean actually cross it's just come and touch it it could also be on the other side it depends on whether it's coming from above the x-axis 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 or below the x-axis so it just come to that point touches it goes up just like a parabola like a quadratic function and if it has a multiplicity of three, three, oops, or five or seven, and then the graph is going to cross the x-axis like a um, chair shape. So it could come, let's see, this is the x-intercept. It could come down to this, this point, like really, like a really flat there and it pass it a little bit flat, but then it comes back to the other side. So right where this x-intercept is, it's a little bit flat. It's not really flat, flat, but it's like, it looks like it's flat. So this has this like a chair-shaped crossing. Now, it, it could also depend on, you know, how it comes to that point. It could also have a, you know, it might come in down on the left, instead of on the right, and then become a little bit flat. I usually just draw a small segment that's flat, but it's really not flat at all. So it could be like this. It depends on which direction it comes to the x-axis. So that's something to keep in mind. I just want to repeat that. When we have a multiplicity of one, so that means a function has x minus h to the first power at this x in the step h. Uh, multiplicity of two, four, or six, you might have x minus h squared, or could be x minus h to the fourth power, and so on. 
but if you have a chair shaped crossing, it's going to have x minus h cubed or x minus h to the fifth power or the seventh power. Any questions about those local behavior, the, the multiplicity of the zeros and the, how the polynomials cross the x axis? Um, I'm assuming that some of you have seen it in the past, if not all of you. All right, we're almost done here. There's a couple of things I need to do to finish up. Um, hopefully, I'm going to let you leave before 8.30. Just um, you know, be patient with me here. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is how do we find the y-intercept? Oh, wait a minute, before I talk about that. Um, yeah, that's okay. Um, so the next thing as for local behavior is y-intercept. Well, to find a y-intercept, we're just gonna set x equals zero, always. Doesn't matter which function you look at, if you want to find x-intercept, you set y equals zero. If you want to find a y-intercept, you set x equals zero. So for this given example, we had y equals 4x squared, x plus 1, x minus 2 squared uh, cubed, right? If I want to find y-intercept, what do I do? I set x equals 0. So if I put 0 for x, so we get y equals 4 times 0 squared, 0 plus 1, 0 minus 2 cubed. Well, it doesn't matter. I have a 0 in the front to multiply with, so the whole thing equals 0. So the y-intercept is going to be 0, comma 0, the origin. All right, so that's the y-intercept. All right, let me do two, one, two, 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 two. two. Okay, probably two, three things, and I'm done. Um, so the next thing I want to write down is that if a polynomial function has a degree n, then it has at most n x-intercepts. Because sometimes we have repeated um, roots are repeated zeros, so we actually have a fewer x-intercepts because of that, uh, because of the multiplicity. So at most, we could have n x-intercepts. Right. So now I talk about all those with this function. So let's kind of bring this together. Let's try to sketch it. So recall the function f of x equals 4x squared, x plus 1, x minus 2 cubed has n behaviors. I'm just going to re reorganize all the parts I found with this function. So the n behaviors we had was looking like this, for going upwards on both ends from the leading terms, and it has x-intercepts at those values, x equals zero, that's a multiplicity of two. X equals negative one has a multiplicity of one. X equals two has multiplicity of three. Right, that's what we found earlier. And I remember I just find out that the y-intercept it's going to be zero, zero. Right. With this information, we actually will be able to sketch a graph of this function. So now we're going to sketch this function f of x. Now, before I do that, let me just kind of repeat the 
how the graph will cross the x axis at those at each of those x intercepts. So at x equals zero, because we have a multiplicity of two, so we either going to look like this with a, a parabola touching the x axis above it, or we could have below the x axis a parabola opening downwards. We don't know what it is. We can find it later. With a multiplicity of one at x equals negative one. So the graph is going to cross it like a straight line. So it's going to probably looks like this. It could also going backwards looks like this, but nevertheless, it's just going to be a straight cross the x axis. With multiplicity of three at x equals two, the graph could possibly across the across the x axis looks like this, a little bit flat and then pass it. It could also possibly cross on the left side going towards that point and a little bit flat and then cross this. So it depends. Right, so one of those will be correct. So now let's put all those together and sketch a graph. So the way I do it when we sketch polynomial functions is I usually just begin by labeling the x intercepts, the y intercepts, and the end behavior. So I know the end behavior is going up on both ends. So I'm going to just draw arrow here, means that the end behavior is going to go in upwards um, on both ends. And then we have x intercepts, which is at zero at x equals negative one and at x equals two. I probably should label, move it a little bit to the right. And then the y-intercept is zero, zero. Again, it's the same point, right? So how do we draw the shape? Well, we begin with one end. It doesn't matter whether we begin from the right end or the left end. Just remember that the multiplicity of one for x equals negative one, multiplicity of two for x equals zero, multiplicity of three for x equals two. So if I start from the left, I know the end, the end is going to go upwards. So if I take the tail and start tracing, by the time I get close to this x equals negative one, I know it's going to cross it directly. And it's probably not going to cross this way, right? It's, it's not going to cross like this, because if that's OK, the graph will come here and then it looks like this. That's not a good function. So it must cross the x axis like this. And it's not going to keep going down because it eventually has to go through the next point, the origin. And how does it go through the origin? Well, when it gets close to x equals zero, so it should go up so that it can touch that point. If it touches the point, how does it pass the x-axis? It doesn't because it bounces off. It has the multiplicity of two. So it, this is what we call bounce off. I like to think about cross the x axis for all those cases. And then after it passed the origin, so it's not going to just stay here. It's going to go down, but eventually it has to go up to touch the second point, the last point at x equals two, because if it keeps going down, it's not going to touch that point. So it must turn around and go back up at some point. And when it touched this point at x equals two, it's going to touch it like a chair. So it's going to go up, become a little bit flat, and then go up. So it's not going to be like, a, it's not a straight cross because that's not right. It has a multiplicity of three. So it's kind of become a little bit flat there and then going up. And then we just connect to this tail. Does that make sense? So that's how we graph it. So if, if we get all the y in this, if we get the y intercept, the x intercept, the, the end behavior right, you could not possibly make it wrong if you're careful with the multiplicity. Um, you, you generally get it right. Now, a couple of things I want to mention. So this point down the bottom here, this is what we call turning points. This point, the origin, and at this point where the graph, you know, like coming down and then turns around, go back up or going up and then turn around, going down. 
So those are the turning points. It just means that the direction, for example, on the, from left to right, the graph going down and then going up. So the direction of the graph changes. So those points are turning points. All right, I think we're doing pretty good. There's one more thing I want to do, and I think that will be good for today. Let me find it. Okay, all right, let's look at this one. All right, so here I have a graph. This will be the last example we're gonna do, and then we can we probably be able to finish it in about five to 10 minutes. Probably wouldn't even take that long. So here's the example. So, a graph is, let me quickly sketch this graph. Oops, let me move it up a little bit. I want to make it right here. So that looks like a, a little bit flat at this axis in the set. So this is a negative two. Uh, this is negative four. This one is two. This one is four. So two questions. The first question says, find the zeros So when I say zeros, it means the x intercepts. Find the zeros and describe the multiplicity at each zero. So that's the first part. The second part, I'm going to give myself a space. So write a equation, a formula for this polynomial function in the graph. So two parts. The first thing is that we look at a graph, right? We have a lot of points and we know generally what it looks like. So we need to find out all the zeros and it describes what the multiplicity looks like at each zero. So here we have, we're basically looking for x intercepts, right? And then use the shape, whether how the graph touch those x intercepts to describe the multiplicity. So we have the first x intercept is x equals negative two. And at this x equals negative two, the graph doesn't really cross the x axis. So it sort of touches it and then leaves it and on the same side. So it kind of has this like a parabola shape, right? It's U shaped. So this is what we call a multiplicity of two, could be four, but keep it simple, multiplicity of two, because we have this shape. And then the next X in the set we have is that X equals two. So what does the multiplicity look like? Well, the graph looks like it's gonna go up to this point and become a little bit flat, but then after that it becomes, it passes. So it doesn't cross like a straight line, it crosses like a chair. So, so this has a multiplicity of three or could be five, but let's keep it simple, leave it as three because it looks like a chair shape. And then the last x intercept we have is the x equals four. 
And at x equals four, the curve, the graph simply just cross the x-axis like a straight line. It doesn't make a chair shape. It doesn't make a U shape. It just crosses like a straight line. So that's going to have a multiplicity of one because every time it cross like a straight line, it has a multiplicity of one because it's a straight cross. All right, any questions? All right, the last part. So let's write the formula. Well, the formula, well, we're gonna write down the factor form for the polynomial function. So we're gonna use those x-intercepts. So it's gonna be f of x equals some constant a. We don't know yet, <laughs> excuse me. We don't know what a is, but we can find it later. So a times, the first x-intercept at x equals negative two, that's gonna tell us we're gonna have a factor x minus negative two in the formula. And we have to figure out what the exponent is for x minus negative two. That's where the multiplicity came in. It has a multiplicity of two, so we're gonna have a two as an exponent. And then we keep multiplied by the next x intercept, which at x equals two, so that's gonna be x minus two. And if we need some multiplicity of three, so we're gonna have an exponent three there. And we keep going to the next exponent, we have x equals four, so it's gonna be x minus four as a factor in the polynomial function. And the multiplicity of one tell us it's just gonna have a one as an exponent. We don't even need to write the one. So this will be the, the general formula that will give this shape, but we have to figure out what A is, right? So still need to find A. Well, how do we find A? All we need is another point. Any point will work. If we, can, if we have a point on the graph, we can put in there. And it looks like we do have a point negative four. And uh, Y equals negative four on the Y axis. So use, y intercept zero negative four so we can put zero negative four into this function so we get negative four equals a times zero minus negative two zero plus two squared and times zero minus two cubed times zero minus four and if we are careful we get negative four equals a times two squares four and then negative two cubed is negative eight, and then negative four, and it looks like we can divide by negative four on both sides. So that negative four cancels on the right side, and we end up with one on the left side. So we got one equals a times negative 32. So a equals negative one over 32. So now we put back into the function. So we get f of x equals negative one over 32, parentheses x plus two, that's x minus negative two squared, x minus two cubed, x minus four. So this is the formula. All right, any questions about this example or anything that we talked about today? I know it's like a lot of, material, right? We talk about quadratic functions, power functions, and then now we talk about polynomial functions. Um, any questions? Awesome. Um, like I said, we're gonna have a quiz on Wednesday. Uh, it's only, it's gonna be towards the end of that lecture. It's gonna cover the material we talked about last week. Um, so whatever we talk about today is not gonna be on it. Uh, definitely review your notes. Um, it's gonna be, I think like a, Chapter 1, 1.1, 1.2, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. 2 .2, I think that was it. But anyway, look at your notes from last week. Um, and uh, we're going to have another homework due this Sunday. I'm going to post it today, later today. All right. So, all right. On that note, I'll see you on Wednesday. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Hi, Professor. Yep. I have a quick question. 